kicking off the list at number 10, don't look. Okay, the saying you can look but you can't touch is pretty common and it does not apply to Filippo Maria Visconti. The Duke of Milan during the 14th century, okay, he rose to power after his brother Giovanni was taken out, if you know what I mean, he was pew, he was balconied, you know, we get it. He was known to be extremely cruel and many were unhappy with him so it didn't come out of nowhere per se. Doesn't mean it was right but he was not a nice guy by any means at all. So now, Filippo had to take over come 1412. Filippo was better than his brother. He helped reorganize government finances. He got the silk industry up and running, okay? So he was doing things that were helping the economy. He ended up passing away, like many years later, 30 years later almost, of natural causes. Nothing like his brother at all. But while he was in power, he never showed his face to anybody. He was a man of mystery, like that character from Game of Thrones that we never ended up finding out what happened with. He hid in his palace most of the time because he thought he was ugly. Sadly, he didn't allow anybody even close to him in the palace to look at him. I got a few zits and then I got a few lists to do. I don't get to hide my face. We're all humans, Filippo. It's all good, man. Just embrace it. It's cool. Pop it, see if it hits the mirror, you know? Have fun with it. Number nine, don't touch. Ah uh, yes, the prince that couldn't keep his hands off of himself, out of his pants. I'm not trying to say anything, but I'm trying to say some things. You get it? I'm like YouTube, don't listen. Christian VII of Denmark, okay, he was a young, young lad and he was spoiled like many are on this list. He was comfortable with his body as well and he was a lot of hormones, he was exploring, he was rich, he didn't have people to tell him no. He would often just have his hands in his pants, just hanging out in the middle of dinner, just passing food around to his family, alternating hands and pants to handing out food. What a little twerp, this is the worst thing ever. Now it's unknown really, but historians believe maybe he had a mental disorder. Maybe, could be. Either way, don't touch the rye bread. Christian, please and thank you. Number eight, boot and rally. This guy is one of the worst. Getting into more of the evil people here a little bit. Don Carlos, Spanish crown prince. The guy who just enjoyed being the worst human alive. Absolute piece of rubbish. Now it's been noted that he was born with a hunchback and one leg was shorter. He had the odds against him from birth, okay? And people often feel bad for him a little bit when this is mentioned. It's often like, oh, he killed a lot of people, but he had a hunchback. Yeah, don't feel bad for him. Don Carlos was made hero of the opera by his dad, Philip II of Spain, okay? He was set up to marry Mary, Queen of Scots. He was fine. And he would still hurt people a lot because it was fun. He would roast animals that were alive for fun. And according to historians, Don Carlos once made a cobbler eat a pair of boots because he didn't like how they looked. He made a cobbler eat a pair of shoes. That's the most evil thing I can imagine. Number seven, cherry brandy. Okay guys, start sweating. You're gonna need your fake ID for this one. Prince Charles, okay, at just age 14, decided to walk his little age 14 year old legs to the local Stornoway Harbor Village pub. Yeah, I said pub, not arcade, pub. Kid pulls up a stool, he climbs up, you know, with little kid legs, and then he orders from the bartender in a soft voice, not a chocolate milk, he orders a cherry brandy. The prince was being discreet, but unfortunately a local reporter just happened to be sipping some crispy cold ones at the same time and overheard the young prince get his whistle wet. This was a huge scandal. I mean, obviously a child's like, hey, can I get a drink? Shake it, not stir. That's crazy. Headlines level scandal, obviously. I mean, look at the unwanted attention Malia Obama got for smoking the devil's lettuce while she was going to Harvard. You know, see what people focus on? You get it? In this case, fair. The kid's 14, good call. Save your lover, good eye. Number six. Rudolph the second. Okay, this one is not the red-nosed reindeer. This is the second one. This one's a little bit different. The Holy Roman Emperor from 1552. He was known as a collector. He liked to collect things. Some princes collect stamps, I've mentioned before. Others have a live dodo bird. A little different. Step your game up, I guess. I don't know. He was super into the arts as well. He was into pretty much everything mystical and wonderful. His castle, yeah, castle, was also home to lions, tigers, and orangutans. Yeah, good luck sleeping. He also collected human artifacts. So that's, yeah. Welcome to MTV Cribs. Don't mind the jar of eyes. Come on in, here, check out the sofa. Don't step on that lion's tail either or else it'll eat you. Watch out, careful, watch your head. We're in a castle. What a mess. He's quite important in history though. He supported the scientific revolution. He also poured tons of money into astrology. So next time you read your horoscope, remember it's Jaw Jar Johnny over here that's responsible. I'm a Libra, just so we know. Are we, are we compatible? We'll talk in the comments. Number five, not immortal. Kin Shi Hang was trying to find the key to immortality, and in doing so, he met his fate. 
ironic, I'll say it, it's ironic. The first emperor of China caught wind of old myths. Myths about immortality and these three spirit mountains in the sea. And living on these mountains were these immortals, like a Marvel comic book. It's crazy that he actually thought this. So he searched for what's called the elixir of life. Yeah, like something from Legend of Zelda. Sounds pretty interesting. He once sent hundreds of young men to this Penglai mountain and they were sent to retrieve this elixir. They were sent to find it. Now, they never returned. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that the contact they were supposed to meet was a thousand year old magician. They're like, he's not here. Weird. His next plan was to get his own alchemist to make immortality pills, but unfortunately, they were made of mercury. So those pills were the cause of his death. Don't eat pills or talk to alchemists. We don't need those guys anymore, I don't think. Number four, King Ludwig II. This young lad has numerous castles built for him to resemble fairy tales. How neat. Nobody really knows why he was so obsessed with castles in the first place, but he had the budget to make them, so now he's important and remembered in history. He designed them after his favorite fairy tales. I'll be honest, I kind of love this. Ludwig was only 18 when he later became the King of Bavaria in 1864, and then he had the green light to do this wild teen DIY project, making castles, as in more than one, each of them inspired from romantic literature and his early days with the family at the opera. Wow, his early days at the opera. Must be nice, Chris. I made pillow forts growing up. Does that count? I don't know, kid was a dreamer. So are we all. He would spend his nights in one castle looking through a telescope at his other castle being built. People are hauling bricks up a spiral staircase and he's just watching from his bedroom like, mm, yes, careful, lift with your legs, mm. He should have spent less time looking at fairy tale castle blueprints though because two years later in 1867, he went through a horrible defeat. That's mostly why he's known. Castle boy. Number three, Farouk the first. The youngest son of Egypt's first king, Fouad the first. He was born in 1920 in Alexandria and in his early days at school, he couldn't concentrate. The king sent him to England to hopefully find a new way of teaching and learning, something that works for him, but still no luck. Once the king ended up passing away in 1936, you know what's up, Farouk ended up getting the throne but also he had so much more property. He had hundreds of fancy cars, 75,000 acres of land. He had everything, but still he felt like he needed to take more. Classic. So at just 17 years old, he would slam a bunch of eggs for breakfast, wash it down with bottles of beer, like 30 bottles of beer, just nutritious and delicious in all the wrong places. And he was one of the biggest hoarders ever and he loved to steal. They go hand in hand, hoarders and thieves, I guess. He had thousands of shirts, which is so funny. Just, this guy is, hey, look at my cars and also look at my shirts. This is Animal Crossings, apparently. He had 50 diamond studded walking sticks for some reason, and like a prince, he too collected coins. One of the most bizarre things of Farouk was that he liked to steal. He pickpocketed Winston Churchill once. Guy's insane. Number two, no fun. This is the worst of the worst people. Murad IV, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee like a piece of shit. He was born in 1612 and for the most part his mother was ruling through him like some kind of Game of Thrones plot because he was so young, he didn't really understand it. He didn't know politics, he was just like, chocolate milk. And when he got a little older, he put forth these laws punishable by death, cause why not, in order to get things back on track, make himself more, you know, of a leader, I guess. So he banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. Just no fun, absolutely. Have fun at prom, I guess. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian at nighttime and wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would catch you drinking a coffee in the middle of the night. And then if you were caught, God forbid you're having a smoke break after work, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined. Rod the fourth himself would just take off your head right there in the streets. And then your head would just roll down a road because you had a dark roast. What an And finally coming in at number one, Caligula. Running the clock back to 12 CE, Gaius Caesar, AKA Caligula, AKA the Roman emperor at the time, Apparently, he was close with his horse. Some say he was a little too close, but I'm not gonna get into that. I had two dogs growing up, I would rather die for those little piggies, all right? And if I had the money, yeah, I'd probably make them a house as well made of marble. He gave his horse a marble stall, and it got to the point where they were so close, they were homies, they were so tight, that Caligula was about to appoint the horse to the high office of council. But he was taken out. He was, a, so I can't say the word, but he was pew from afar. Imagine if you lived and this happened, what would those meetings look like? Or rather, what would those meetings smell like? Count me out. Number 10, Prince Harry. Rotten, off with something familiar, Prince Harry. I feel like this man needs no introduction, especially if you were watching the news, say, oh, around circa 10 years ago. The now married and humble prince was quite the partier back in the day. I'm sure our editors can find a safer work image out there somewhere. 
A couple wild parties in beautiful Las Vegas had the royal family a little concerned. And when people say they're a little concerned, it means they're really concerned. At one party, he was stark naked. What? I know, right? It was weird. I kind of remember that, actually. And another where he was wearing a certain uniform from a certain time in Germany that would raise a few hands and eyebrows. You know what I'm saying? Thank goodness he's cleaned up, though. He's doing a lot better now, and he's married to the very beautiful Meghan Markle. Listen, Meghan, uh, if it doesn't work out, you call me. You and I, to get, we'll, we'll make it happen. You and I. A great husband. I, I'll, I'll help. Number 9, Prince Edward VII. The spoiled prince's spoiled prince. He's a man who had everything just given to him. The poster boy for silver spoons. Being the son of Queen Victoria comes with benefits. The second Eduardo was born, he automatically became a prince, a duke, and an earl of a couple of titles. In comparison, when I was born, it was a cold Canadian morning, and my family was watching through a glass screen at a brand new sweet babe. When one of my family members was holding a double-double said, why does he have three arms? I'm just kidding, I don't have three arms. But the point I'm making is that I, like many others, simply weren't born into the good stuff. We had to do this thing called work. I know, right? It sucks. Edward lived the life of luxury until becoming king in the early 1900s. The only thing I've been king of is the playground. And that's just because I was big and I pushed everyone off. This is my slide. Thank you, get on. Number eight, Prince Charles. All right, put your tinfoil hats on here, folks. We're going right into it. Okay, so Prince Charles, son of Elizabeth. It's the 1980s. Life is good. Ladies' formal wear has padded shoulders for some reason. Eddie Murphy is wearing red leather, and Millie Vanilli is an acceptable art form and not a fever dream of the past. Good times. So Prince Charles does the most 80s thing ever and marries the most beautiful princess ever to grace us mortals. I mean, come on, look at her. She was gorgeous. So it makes sense that you'd want to leave the most beautiful princess in the whole world after having two kids, right? Okay, but how? How do you leave Princess Diana? How about perhaps maybe kind of sort of might have uh, been plausible that Prince Charles uh, organized her car accident, hmm, which resulted in her passing. For him, Princess Diana was a warm-up. Oof. For others, she was an inspiration and a conversation starter for middle-aged women across the Midwest. Do you remember where you were when Princess Diana passed away? I do. I was eating cheese at the kitchen table. Number seven, George V. Honestly, this one could be number one on the list, but it's just so strange. Okay, so for those that don't know, George V, Nicholas II, and Wilhelm II were all cousins. Who were these royals I'm talking about? Well, these are the men who were in charge of their respected empires during the early 1910s. Why is George on this list? Well, in a nutshell, George and his cousins had the opportunity to de-escalate a very chaotic political situation in Europe. Old feuds were reignited by the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, and fingers were being pointed. Fingers quickly turned into guns, and hence, WW1 had started. Not a great situation to find yourself in. WW1 was kind of a bad one. Imagine your family having the power to stop a major global catastrophe and doing nothing. Nice! Number six, the Tsar. Being a prince turned king is hard. It's even harder to be a Tsar. I'd ask Nicholas II, but he ain't around anymore. Being a wealthy Tsar for a people that majority of don't have anywhere close to the same luxuries as the rest of Europe is even harder. There's a lot of things that can be said about the Tsar, especially his negligence for the Russian people. However, one event kind of sums up the whole thing. Imagine for a second if you were a poor Russian serf, working day and night for nothing, when all of a sudden a new Tsar says, Come on down, the folks. I know you're hungry. Come, enjoy some fresh hot pretzel and perhaps some beer. Since this was the best food a lot of people were going to have for a very long time, people rushed the grounds, and this stampede left over 1,000 people lifeless on the fairgrounds. The Tsar's response to his little strategic mistake? Party with the French royalty and not acknowledge his poor planning that had caused a major catastrophe. Oh, how many people? Hey, let's go party. Come, let's go. Hey. Number five, Alexander the Great. 
the son of Philip II and heir to the Macedonian throne. Alexander was the star child, and while it's true it may have gone to his head, he did make it work for him. The spoiled prince became king at 20, which is very young in case you were wondering, and during his youth would create one of the largest empires the earth would ever see. He was undefeated in battle and likely one of, if not the best, military strategist of all time. More than 20 cities were founded in his name, including the great city of Alexandria in Egypt. I don't have any cities named after me, but I do have a cool nickname though. Do I want my own empire? Sure, why not? The Cheddar Empire sounds pretty sick. Nice, the Cheddar Empire, I like that. Do I want all the naughty war related stuff that he did? No, I don't want that. I don't like that. I'm thinking more like a comedy empire, stand-up tours, movies, and of course merchandise. That's how you know it's real, folks. You get quotable t-shirts. That's how you know it's real. Don't sniff your own farts. That's a, that's a good t-shirt. Some of you would wear that. I know you would. Number four, Suleiman the Magnificent. The prince turned sultan, Suleiman the Magnificent of the Ottoman Empire. Probably the most famous of all the sultans, and for having a really big hat. For real, that's a, that's, that's a big boy. That's a big boy right there. No, he's actually known for taking the Ottoman Empire that was good and making it great, plunging it right into a golden era. Successful military campaigns and some law reforms made him stand out. Speaking of standing out, it's his collection of ladies of the evening. This is the, this is the bad part where it stated that he had 17 personal ladies to service the mighty royal in his time of need. Yes, this did produce offspring, and yes, this did make things confusing for who is next in line. Number 3, Mansa Musa. Nothing says spoiled like being the richest man of the ancient world. Maybe even of all time, actually. A royal who rose to power and exploited his nation's salt and gold mines, which in return made him quite wealthy. Net worth is estimated to be in the $400 billion range, but it could be a lot more. We're not sure. I don't know about you fine folks, but when I get some extra cash in my pocket, just itching to get out there, I go head down to the mall. Sure, mall culture isn't what it used to be from the 80s, but I gotta hit up the gap, man. Good sales. But that's exactly what Mansa Musa did. However, he went to multiple cities, and when he went shopping in said cities, he spent so much money that he upset the economy of said city. That's just such a baller move, dude. Damn, all right. Okay. Number two, William the Conqueror. The illegitimate child. A man who most likely would not take the throne since there were others in line. So what does William do? He says, nah, all right, I'm the Duke of Normandy. That's Scottish, but we're gonna go with it. I'm the Duke of Normandy, I don't have to take this. Thus began the Norman Conquest, and conquest William did. From the Battle of Hastings to all the other lovely things Williams did, he was the spoiled prince who didn't take no for an answer. What's the lesson in this one? See things through? Or being born into an intertwining European family is complicated. Sometimes swords can solve things. Number one, Mohammed bin Salam. Here's a modern prince for you, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. There's a lot that can be said, but all that you basically gotta know is that the family, the royalty, is very rich. Arab oil rich. Sure, the British royal family is treated like kings and queens with servants and whatnot, but these guys, whew, they live every day like that. And it is for sure more luxurious than old Blay. Dude's got money, it's rich. I love the visit though, it looks like a cool place, I don't know. Number 10, watch party, marriage. Nothing like legally tying yourself to another human being for the rest of your life. Everyone loves a good wedding, but if I was invited to one in the Middle Ages, well, you can count me out of the final event. You see, it was popular at the time to prove your marriage is legit, and one way of doing that was consummating it. But we can't just take your word for it, don't be silly, no. Instead, every member of your family, and maybe some members of the court if you're royal, will come with you into the bedchamber to spectate and make sure the deed is done. Imagine being the lady who would sometimes be carried to the chamber by her family members. Now, obviously, things were a little different then. Marriages were not really a thing of love. It was strictly business. And of course, they had different ideas of what exactly was private. So this is purely from our modern point of view, but I can imagine it was particularly uncomfortable having your least favorite cousin in the room. Number nine, Ivan the Terrible, the first Tsar of Russia. A man who was as cold and brutal as the winters that surrounded him. Ivan had it rough growing up. Both of his parents pulled a Bruce Wayne and passed away when he was very young. Afterwards, he and his siblings were not raised the best. Once described as having nothing but rags to wear, which in that climate must have been awful. So, did little Ivan grow up to be a super rich yet dark hero bent on serving the criminals of the night cold justice, just like his Gotham counterpart? 
No, no he did not. He became wealthy, but awful. Terrible, some might say. There are a hundred stories about Ivan and his cruelty, but my favorite is that of St. Basil Cathedral. You know the one. Anytime Russia is shown on TV, it's like a North Pole Christmas Onion Palace looking thing. You know the one I'm talking about. After it was completed, he had the architect's eyes gouged out so no one could ever build anything more beautiful. <sighs> Number 8. Red card. Actually, I doubt anyone was given a red card when they played soccer back in the day. It would have just been too difficult to even determine who it was exactly that got the card. The rules of the medieval precursor to soccer were pretty, um, basic. There basically weren't any. In Shrove Tide football, the goals could be a couple hundred yards to miles apart. There were an unlimited number of players, and the only rule literally says that you could use any means necessary to score apart from the actual ending of someone's life. It still happened though, even by accident, because you take every man from your village, or even from two different opposing villages, and you take one leather bladder ball and say, do whatever you can to score. People are gonna get punched, kicked, stomped on, trampled, bruised, bloodied, and de-lifed. This mob football was hated by lords and kings. Edward II, Edward III, Richard II, and Henry IV all tried to have it banned, but, well, have you ever met a football or soccer fan? Number seven, human decorations. Sticking with the theme of crazy dudes from Europe comes one of the craziest, Vlad the Impaler. Sure, Ivan was bad, but imagine being so bad, so awful, that your alias is a verb for what you do to people. So specific. For example, Adam would be Adam the talker during movies. Ugh, worse. Or Adam the bedwetter. Not that I've ever wet the bed or anything. <laughs> what? Don't even ask. What? Don't ask my mom. What? Well, Vlad has this weird knack for decorating. The enemies of his kingdom would meet a terrible fate. Think of how bad a toothpick would hurt if someone poked you with it. Okay, now imagine it's a large, sharp wood pike that some lovely gentleman would sit you on. Ugh. As you slowly become one with the pike, you look around and see a field of others who have also met the same fate. The sky turns blood red. Black thick clouds form as the moon beams through and shines down on the beast of a man who would dare do this to his people. Vlad the Impaler, a man who did unspeakable things and was the inspiration for Dracula. Who knew, right? Who thought? Who, who, who thought? Number six, body on trial. And where were you on the night of April the 27th? You see, members of the jury, his stunned silence only proves his guilt. Pope Stephen VI was an interesting guy, but I think the most interesting thing he may have done was in 897 when he ordered Pope Formosus, the last guy in his position, dug up and put on trial. What's worse than digging up a dude and yelling at him in a courtroom, finding him guilty, taking away his papal finery and a few fingers, and then reburying him? Digging him back up again and throwing him in the Tiber River. Apparently, the whole thing was possibly a way of covering up the crimes that Pope Stephen had committed because, you see, this guy was one of the first popes to bring on what people call the most corrupt era in the history of the papacy. This pope didn't last too long, thanks to some unsurprising mob justice. And the next guy who became pope, thankfully, outlawed the whole mortal husk on trial thing. Number five. War! What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it again. War, what is it good for? Well, if you need oil, it actually kind of works out. Yes, it's warm, it's bad, it's naughty, and we've been doing it forever. I was gonna do more specifics, but I'll save that for a part two maybe, we'll see. I'm talking more about the brutality of medieval combat. Swords, shields, spears, pikes, halberds, axes, hammers, maces, bows, crossbows, catapults, trebuchets, rams, fire arrows, and if you're a fan of Ocarina of Time, ice arrows. I'm not sure how that works, but Link's magical, we'll go with it. The truth is, medieval combat was brutal, walking miles to every battle, sometimes with limited supplies, which meant sometimes armies pissed Village. Mm hmm yeah, not nice. If you were injured in battle, there was a high chance that you would get infected. And then that's picture wrap for you. It's a time of knights and glory, but also a time of great war and loss. All a guy can hope for is that whatever knight is gonna cut me up like a sushi roll, well, at least I'd hope he had the decency to disinfect his weapons with their favorite brand of disinfectant. Come on, let's be serious here. Number four, not the kitties. We all know that apparently black cats are bad luck, and that two of them in a row signifies a glitch in the matrix. You have Pope Gregory IX to thank for that. In 1232, Greg wrote Vox in Rama, 
which supposedly exposed the rituals of a cult of witches that lived in northern Germany. Among some of the things they summoned, including the big red with horns himself, was a black cat that appeared to be kissed and adored by the worshippers. The Great Cat. You've already heard of witch hunters, well now you've heard of cat hunters. People took the great cat mentioned in Vox and Rama and applied that idea to every cat. And they did not hold back. Like at all. The cat population almost got to extinction point. Didn't work out too well for them when rat populations saw a huge increase not too much later though, huh? Touch my cat and you ain't making it to tomorrow, that's all I'm saying. Number 3 Criminal Cookoff Criminals, they're everywhere and have been since the dawn of time. It also seems that since the dawn of time, people have been coming up with lots of different ways to deal with said criminals. One of the medieval favorites of the Holy Roman Empire was boiling criminals in oil. Nice! Save for the truly heinous crooks and those who dare defraud coinage. Yes, that's right, don't dare fraud the coin or you could end up like last night's suckling duck. Boiling oil was even used in defense during castle sieges. Get too close to the walls and, well, you'd get a boiling barrel of Crisco's finest as hair grease. Boiling oil leaves horrible burns and is extremely painful. I don't know, I shouldn't have to tell you that. If you ever cook bacon without a shirt on, then you know. The kind of grit you need to stay close to that sizzling pan, I, I envy you. Because yeah, those things totally relate though, absolutely. Number 2. Pope Not So Innocent the Third. Look, I'm sorry I'm talking about Pope so much, but you gotta know that a heck of a lot of horrible things that happened in the Middle Ages were caused by the decisions of the church, and specifically, that one little decision of forcefully dealing with anyone who disagrees or insults your religion. For example, in 1209, there was a group of heretics called the Cathari in southern France who believed that the Roman Catholic Church itself was established by the same people who brought an end to the life of Christ. Now, that didn't really fly too well with Pope Innocent III, who in response launched the Albigensian Crusade that became a 20 year long full military campaign. A particular event that's worthy of mention here is when the Crusaders took the town of Toulouse. The soldiers couldn't figure out who the heretics were among the people there, so Commander Simone de Montfort said, destroy them all, the devil will know his own. That's messed up, dude. Number one, something going around. Another warfare related one here, but this one is just awful. I'll make this one brief. Basically, you got a castle that needs entering or a palace that needs a good siege. You get your catapults ready, you load them up with the secret sauce. And by that, I mean these bad boys were loaded with the latest commoners who had succumbed to the bubonic plague. Yes, they were launching plague bodies over walls in hopes that it would make the enemy sick. And sometimes they would even fling some poop over there. Oof. It's such a smart move though, right? It's just so heinous and gross. When it was all said and done, I bet there was no hand washing to be found. At number 10, royal enemas. Apparently, back in the day, enemas were all the rage amongst the elite. It was believed that enemas were good for your health, so everyone was doing it to try and live a little longer than the rest of those commoners and peasants. One person who really just couldn't get enough enemas in his life was King Louis XIV. It is believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. When I tell you this guy was obsessed, I'm not kidding. One year, Louis received 212 enemas in just the one year. And of course, he had to make his enemas a little jazzy and couldn't just use water like any other person. Oh no, my guy was using things like almond milk. His enemas were also sometimes scented with orange or rose and sometimes even colored just to make it a little more special. To get an idea of just how obsessed the elite were with receiving enemas, just think about the fact that a French duchess once received one during a court ball. The duchess was in the middle of having a conversation with Louis XIV and during this conversation, Conversation, one of her maids came over, snuck under her dress, and gave the duchess an enema on the spot. Ew. These people were so weird. At number 9, Pampered Pony. I'm sure I can speak for most people when I say when you have a pet, you love and care for that thing like it is your child, right? Well, one Roman emperor might have taken that concept a little bit too far because saying that he was obsessed with his horse is an understatement. The Roman emperor known as Caligula had a horse named Incitatus. Caligula was a horse racing enthusiast, so Incitatus was his pride and joy, and not too many people were all that thrilled about it to be honest. When I tell you this horse 
horse was treated better than most people have ever been, I'm not kidding. The horse's stall was made out of marble, his manger was made out of ivory, and he was even fed oats flaked with gold. Caligula was also very adamant about his horse receiving a good and restful sleep before a race, and he was so serious about it that he made guards stand outside of the horse's stable to make sure that the horse remained undisturbed while it slept. This horse even had its own furniture. Like what is he gonna do with it? He's a horse. Caligula was so fond of his horse that he even made it a priest and promised to make him consul, which was the lead position in the Roman government after the emperor, highly coveted by senators. This was the last straw for people because the emperor was putting his horse above his own people, so he was assassinated. At number eight, Mummia Medicine. It's safe to say that medicine from the past is very different from modern times. These days we have pharmaceuticals to treat illnesses, but back in the days of old there were very different and quite questionable methods of treating ailments, and one of those methods included cannibalism. In the 16th and 17th centuries, it was common practice for elites like priests, kings, and other nobles to consume remedies that included human bones, blood, and fat as medicine to treat ailments from headaches to epilepsy, and this practice was called mummia medicine. At first, it started with people using Egyptian mummies and skulls from Irish graves for use in medicine, as bones would be ground and used in different tinctures for various uses. But soon, other parts of the body started to be used. Human fat was later used to treat ailments on the outside of the body, and blood would be consumed as well as it was believed to contain the vitality of life. Several monarchs were known to use mummia medicine, like Charles II and William II of England, Francois I of France, and Christian IV of Denmark. At number 7, Kissing Sheets For thousands of years, monarchs worried about the threat of being poisoned by their enemies, and so they thought of an array of precautions to take in order to prevent being taken out by some kind of spicy death sauce or something. Many monarchs hired tasters to try their food before it was given to the king to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, but some monarchs were also afraid of being poisoned through something that they touched. This is why Henry VIII hired someone with a very important job to make sure that his bed wasn't poisoned. The person who was tasked with making the king's bed was also required to kiss every part of his bed in the morning. They would kiss the pillows, sheets, and blankets to prove that someone hadn't smeared poison on it. The king was also concerned with people poisoning clothing too, so his clothes as well as his son's clothes were also tested for poison before getting dressed. At number 6, Eternal Youth I know that there are a lot of people out there who want to live forever. I am one of those people. I am afraid of dying, but I also want to see what humanity will look like many many years from now until the sun consumes the earth. Unfortunately, that's kind of impossible, at least for now, until we come up with some kind of way to make people live longer. But this idea of prolonging your life has been around for thousands of years, and one Chinese emperor was super obsessed with the idea, and really tried his best to live for at least another 10,000 years. Emperor Ying Zhang was obsessed with finding a magic elixir that would make him live longer, and he demanded that his subjects find this immortality elixir for him. Now, even though he brought a lot of prosperity to people during his rule, he never let go of his demand for immortality, and it put a lot of pressure on his underlings to find him something to help him live forever, but obviously that didn't happen. He was so concerned with his lifespan that he even brought magicians into his court. His obsession alienated him from his people, and after after all of that effort trying to live longer, he died at the age of 49. At number 5, no bathing. These days, bathing is kind of a necessary thing. You gotta be clean, you have to smell nice, you have to practice proper hygiene. But back in the olden days, this was the complete opposite and nobles rarely ever bathed and it was kind of a trend. Over time, physicians began to believe that bathing was dangerous and obviously the nobility tried to protect their lives and well-being at all costs and so they just stopped bathing. In a popular 16th century medical book, it was advised, quote, use not baths or stews nor sweat too much. For all openeth pores of a man's body, maketh the venomous air to open, and for to infect the blood." End quote. So yeah, they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. In the late 15th century, Queen Isabella of Spain would go around bragging about the fact that she had only ever bathed twice in her whole life. Weird flex, but okay. King James IV apparently never bathed, and his hygiene was so bad that he passed on lice to other people who went into a room that was frequented by the king. He also never washed his hands before eating and would just rub his fingers with the wet end of a napkin. These people were gross. 
At number four, Prankster King. You know that you're a spoiled king when you can pull pranks on people constantly and never have anyone try and stop you or fight back. This was basically the life of King Christian VII of Denmark, who was known for being pretty childish and playing pranks on people his whole life. He was a troublemaker through and through. He was known to play pranks on his grandmother by putting pins in her throne and he would throw things at her and he even ran through the streets with his friend and his mistress, destroying shops and patronizing brothels. He even made his own torture rack, had himself tied to it and flogged. Why? I have an idea, but I don't want to think about that one too hard. One of the other weird things that he was known to do was leapfrog over dignitaries when they would bow to him. This guy was really quite immature. At number three, saints in bed. I understand the desire to feel protected by whatever gods or saints you might believe in. That's one of the whole points of religion. However, I think some people can take that idea a little bit too far, and by some people, I mean the Spanish royal family. These guys took religion very, very seriously, and they believed that following religion heavily would allow God to heal them when they were sick. So, when a member of the royal family was ill, doctors would remove body parts or even entire corpses of saints from churches and monasteries and would put them in bed with the person who was ill. Yeah, they slept with the corpses of dead saints to be healed of their sickness. Could you imagine if that was still how medicine was practiced today? At number two, rat court martial. There has been a record of many kings throughout history who were complete children through and through. Even though many of them grew into adulthood, they still acted immature, and one of the greatest examples of that was Peter III of Russia. He was not a good ruler or a good husband to his wife, who would later become Catherine the Great. Peter spent every night in bed with her playing toy soldiers because he was obsessed with his little dolls. He was so obsessed, in fact, that when a rat chewed the head off one of his toy soldiers, he was so upset that he held a proper military court martial for the rat. He proclaimed the rat guilty of treason and had it hung in a tiny gallows that he had built for the occasion. It was weird, but in the end that bizarre event helped Catherine overthrow her husband, so I guess it kind of worked out for someone. And finally, at number one, groom of the stool. Guys, I found the worst job in history. You think working at the one star Domino's pizza in your neighborhood is bad? Wait until you find out about the groom of the stool. The groom of the stool was a job created during the reign of Henry VIII, where the role was to monitor and assist the king in his bowel movements. They would carry around a commode at all times, and they were also tasked with monitoring the king's diet and meal times, and would organize the king's days around his is uh break times. They were also tasked with undressing the king for him to do his business, and it's also been suggested that they would have had to quote, cleanse the royal posterior as well. Sounds like a pretty crappy job to me, but I'm 